Welcome to the Black Catholic Messenger Show, where we keep it Black and Catholic. I'm Alessandra Harris, and I'm excited for our show today. Mary Bast, a guest contributor to BCM, and I will be interviewing Olga M. Segura, an opinion editor at National Catholic Reporter and the author of the book, Birth of a Movement, Black Lives Matter and the Catholic Church. Mary pitched the idea to BCM to interview Olga, and I'm glad she set up this interview, and we're so happy Olga accepted. If you would like to reach out to us as a contributor, we have a pinned tweet on our Twitter at BLKCATH, C-A-A-T-H stories, with a Google form where you can reach us, or you can visit our website, blackcatholicmessenger.com. Olga, can you tell us where people can find you on, online and when the book will be available? Sure. Um, so people can follow me um, for all my interesting and boring rants on Twitter <laughs> at Olga, Olga M. Segura. And then you can get the book at Orbis.com or it's out everywhere February 17th. But if you can't wait for February 17th, you can get it um, from Orbisbooks.com. Okay, thanks so much. And we know there's a lack of people of color and especially Black Catholics in Catholic media. Can you tell us about how you started writing for Catholic publications? Sure, sure. So I started writing for Catholic media kind of accidentally. I had gone to Fordham University and graduated in 2011 with a double major. And at that time, if you were graduating from college, you know that it was very difficult to find a job after graduation. And so I was kind of just like, working at the gap and interning here and there and just thinking like why did I get an English and Italian literature degree like what the hell is this going to help me out and then I had a friend who worked at America Media and I had lunch with her and I met her boss at the time and they happened to be looking for someone to fill the editorial assistant position and they were looking for someone who was because America Media is a Jesuit publication they were looking for someone who studied English, went to a Jesuit university, and who didn't mind the fact that it was a very, very entry-level job. And I was like, sign me up immediately. Um, but then it just got me interested in publishing. And then I went from there, went from being an editorial assistant to an assistant editor, associate editor, and then was there for eight years and then eventually left. And now I'm an opinion editor at the National Catholic Reporter. But all of that started sort of it was just a, a really big coincidence. And then once I got in there, I was like, oh, okay, this is where I can report. This is the space where I can sort of figure out what kind of writing I, I will want to do in the future. So that's sort of my, my introduction into Catholic media. That's really um, an interesting story. And I'm so glad that you are a voice in Catholic media right now. Um, and I know when you became an opinion editor, you put out a call and said you're especially interested in Black, Indigenous, people of color voices and their opinions. And I'm just wondering what kind of response did you get? The response that I got was extremely, at first it was extremely positive and overwhelming. I think people were really excited, but then I realized because there hasn't been that trust in Catholic media, because it's been so white, people of color are extremely hesitant, even when you put out that call. So I think a lot of people were really excited and really engaging with it on Twitter. But because there's that lack of trust on the part of editors who have been in this space for a very long time, it's, it requires me to sort of be more proactive. So one of the things that I try to do is to reach out to people individually and be like, you know, I saw that you were talking about this. Would you be interested in turning this into a piece? Or if you're interested in writing, what would you like to write about? Because one thing that editors, especially in 2020, at a lot of the bigger, at a lot of the big white Catholic media publications, need to realize that there is a lack of trust. So when you put out these calls, people are not necessarily going to be as responsive as you would like. So I, I just take that as a challenge, and it's just our responsibilities as editors to really do a lot of that work. Absolutely. That really makes a lot of sense. Um, the Black Lives Matter organization has been labeled by a lot of people as anti-Christian. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you explore how founders Patrice Cullors and Opal Tometi grew up in Christian households. Mm -hmm. And though Cullors no longer identifies as Christian, Tometi does. And her work is influenced by liberation theology and one of its main founders, Gustavo Gutierrez Marino. Can you expound on BLM and its Christian if influence more for our listeners? 
Sure, sure. So a lot of that context um, you just gave says it all kind of perfectly. Um, they grew up in Christian homes. Two of the founders of this movement grew up in Christian, ho Christian homes. And e in the present day, they might not practice that Christianity or their spirituality the same way that a lot of sort of white Catholics in our church sort of interpret it to be. But to me, the reason it resonated with me so deeply and why I wanted to make sure to include this in the book is because I think it's a perf they're both a perfect example of what it actually means to be someone who's trying to be a faithful person in the 21st century, right? And I think that in our faith is very much an evolution, especially as Catholics. We talk a lot about the Catholic imagination and we talk about God being in all things and therefore everything, if you really think about it, is Christianity in movement. And these two women, they just, their work, their advocacy to me felt extremely like the gospel, felt extremely like what we are called to do. And for me, that was so important to highlight in the book. And that was so important to feature because I think that even if they themselves might not have the relationship to Christianity that a lot of people might have in our church, I still think that it is a powerful example of what it means to be Christian witness. And I think a lot of people have a difficulty with that because in our church, we have a very specific understanding of what it means to be faithful in public. And that's often centered in very misogynistic white supremacist ideas. So I think that that's always why there's this sort of pushback when you talk about a movement that is not quote unquote, super Christian or super Catholic by the standards that we sort of define those terms. But I think for me, it just, I found myself so, so challenged by their work. And I found that I became an actual stronger Catholic when I started engaging with the movement and just the activists who were engaging with it, with it more broadly. Yeah, that was, um, that was something that I really liked about uh, your book was how you, you interspersed like your personal transformation and their their journeys with that mm -hmm. um and there was um kind of on the lines of that like individual um that that individual resonance and individual stories um there one of the things that had moved me the most about your book was the way you um intentionally included the names and details of victims of police shootings um and like, I'm sad to say there are so many names that I didn't know until I read your book. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you talked about the need to center the lived experiences of the victims and survivors. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like the things you mentioned conversing with the, um, with Black Lives Matter founders taught you. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the editorial choice to structure your content that way. Um, you know, why you decided to do that and, and how important it is both in the sense of um, of cultivating our our own faith, but also just in the sense of uh, rehumanizing and making the lived experiences of these victims central to um, to I guess black liberation. <laughs> really. Right, right, sure, sure. That those are really, really great questions that you're raising there. I think the reason, or not, I think I know the reason <laughs> when I was when I started research for the book. I was very focused on making sure, and this was something that's, that sort of stayed through, that never sort of changed from the time I signed the contract to when I actually uh, wrote the book. I wanted to make sure to provide a kind of timeline um, for Catholics in our church, because I think we have this, and this is not just an issue with the church, this is an issue that we have as a society more broadly in the United States, but there is this sort of impetus to just revise history and to forget things that have really been played a huge role in oppression in the United States. For example, we're seeing what happened uh, at the Capitol on January 6th, how a lot of people, it's a month today and you're already seeing a lot of people sort of want to move past what, everything that happened at the Capitol. And so I wanted to go into this and be very explicit about the fact that these are events that have happened. These are events that our church has yet to acknowledge. And so I wanted to make sure to provide that timeline. And I wanted to make sure to include as many of the names as possible, because I think a lot of people look at this movement and look at victims of police brutality or police harassment in general, and think that these are just names that you see in a hashtag or you see on the news or you see on whatever screen you might be watching, but these are people who have families. These are people who were taken from homes that look like mine, look like my fiance's, look like so many people in this church. And I wanted people to understand that, especially white Catholics, I wanted to make white Catholics uncomfortable with that because for 
black and brown people in this church, we already know this trauma. We already carry this oppression with us every day. But I wanted white Catholics to encounter this book and be really challenged by having to see those names, see those stories, because it's not easy to, even for me, writing this book and watching videos of police brutality, revisiting a lot of this history, it's not easy. And it does have a huge effect on your spirituality. It has a huge effect on your day-to-day -day life. And that, and I am not an anomaly in this church, right? This happens to every person who is struggling, who is from a marginalized community. And so I wanted those names and that time, every single timeline in the book to just really be a reminder to white Catholics, especially or white Americans more broadly, who want to, who are so quick to undermine this movement, who are so quick to label it and just racial justice movements more broadly. They're so quick to say, oh, this movement is communist. This movement is Marxist. This movement is not about a pro-life mission, but racial justice movements at the end of the day are sparked because there's very real violence that people of color, black Americans in particular, face every single day. And I wanted this book to put all of that trauma in the face of white Catholics and tell them, hey, you have to do something because these are our lives, right? This is an existential danger that we face every day. And you guys have the pleasure of going to sleep at night and saying, you know, my white kid is not going to get harassed by police officers if he walks to the grocery store, but that's not a reality for us. And I wanted those names to be a reminder of that. And I wanted to use that as a way in the small way that I could to just sort of honor the memories of all of these victims. Yeah, that was, to me, that was one of the most beautiful things in there. And I think what you said about, or what you had said about, um, because I think it's like in, I think it was in your introduction or at least near the beginning, you had talked about how you initially wanted it to be a sort of like gentle uh, type of thing, but then it be, but as 2020 happened, it became a lot more, um, more almost like mission oriented and everything. Um, and I love, I love that you're not afraid to make white people uncomfortable because so I'm, you know, obviously I'm white, um, but I, um, I grew up in that type of background where it race wasn't talked about as much. So it's been as much of a personal transformation for me. And I have seen so, so like all those buzzwords, like communist, Marxist, like anti-Christian, those are thrown out so much. And I think it is so important for any growth just for for that individual sense of encounter to come and the way that you center the victim stories. I just, that, that to me is like the foundation of everything. So I really appreciated how you did that. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Thank you so much. And that's what I'm hoping happens, right? I'm hoping that people, one, are challenged and are uncomfortable, but then they push through that and then they think, okay, what can I do? Or what, not what, not just what can I do, but I should be doing something, absolutely. I've been complicit. Maybe it might not have been as big as a bishop in our church, but I've been complicit and what more can I do? And so I'm glad to hear that that, that was your experience encountering the text, Mary. No problem, thanks for writing it. <laughs> um, and Olga, you write um, on June 1, 2020, Bishop Mark J. Seitz kneeled and held a Black Lives Matter poster during an eight minute prayer for George Floyd in El Paso, Texas. And when asked why he knelt in solidarity with the fight for black liberation, Seitz declared, quote, to say all we who eat from the table of the Eucharist should be able to say that Black Lives Matter is just another way of repeating something we in the United States seem to so often forget that God has a special love for the forgotten and oppressed. What do you think has to happen within the church for all its clergy and its members to accept this profound truth and to be able to also say that Black Lives Matter? Yeah, that's a really, a really important question. And I think that one, especially following what happened earlier or last month at the start of the year is especially crucial in our, in our church right now. I think that the first thing we have to see is we have to see the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops collectively perform those kind of acts of solidarity. And I'm talking about public acts of solidarity, right? Because I think a lot of people want to say, well, you know, the bishops are doing something, but they're doing it behind the scenes, right? Or clergy, they're doing the work. They just don't want to be public because it's not about publicizing. And I understand that to a degree. However, when you know that a very specific community within your church is suffering, when this very specific community is being killed at the hands of the state, whether that's law enforcement or a global pandemic, it is imperative for you as the leaders of our church, right? These are the pastoral leaders of the American church 
then it is imperative for you to go out there and do those kind of acts that we saw sites and not just individual bishops, but collectively, right? Because these are men who, for better or worse, represent a very specific part of our church, right? This is the hierarchy. These are men who have access and power that the three of us will never have, right? Because that's just the nature of our church. And so in order for them to really start to shift that narrative and to see, and to shift that perception that we have of them, they need to do publicly, they need to one, align themselves with this movement. And they don't have to say, I'm going to join a Black Lives Matter organization tomorrow, right? Because that's not how they, that's not how our church functions. But they could say, hey, we want to create a more liberated and equitable church and country. And we are going to get involved in this fight. And we are going to tell you every single month this year how we can do that. We're going to show you where we're fundraising money to support organizers. We're going to show you organizations that align within church teaching, whatever the language might want to be, but who are creating a more equitable and liberated world, right? I think that our church likes to move very incrementally and very, very slowly. And those are two very simple things that our bishops can just do, right? Say, you know what? We do care about Black lives and we do care that our church has oppressed them and we're going to start to actually reckon with that and here's how we're going to do it and i think that would be such a powerful act from them because i think that if we saw the bishops doing that right a body of mostly white men with a lot of power in this church if we saw them take those types of acts what do you think would start happening with lay catholics it might not be immediate right but we'd see a lot of more white catholics say oh, okay catholicism means racial getting involved in liberation our bishops are doing it, so we have to do it too. So I think those are the, the two steps that I would I would hope our bishops kind of start to do because I think that they can really, really start to challenge and push the church. And I'm not talking about the liberal, more quote unquote leftist Catholics who are who people love to point out. I'm talking about the Catholics who are those moderate white Catholics who think, no, no, no this is a terrorist organization because that's very real criticism that we have of any racial justice movement. Those are the people that our bishops would really sway. And those are also people who might have access and who might have power, who could really contribute to, who could really contribute in helping move the church and the country forward. So I think that those are, those are the steps that I would personally like to see sort of happen from our, from our leaders. Yeah, that was, um, I love the way that you phrase that. I think you were so right about the public witness for things like how just how important that is. Um, and the way that you, um, sorry, I'm just bringing up my screen here. Um, ah, give me one. There we go. Okay. Um, how you had talked about the need for public witness and then also um, just how that could kind of like have a trickle down effect to individual Catholics who tend to be more on like, you know, the the conservatives, I hate using those terms because it's like more than, you know, liberal conservative, like right. human black lives are human lives and that is beyond any political designation. So, um, but one thing that I had wanted, or that it was kind of like a paradigm I noticed throughout your, um, throughout your work that I think not only speaks to the need of public witness, but talks about the intersection of um, individual faith and issues and sort of systemic um, issues and everything like that. Um, Dr. And I'm thinking about uh, how Dr. Pratt pointed out in her foreword that your book addresses like the intertwining of realities of individual and systemic uh, beliefs, practices, and issues, how they interact with one another. Um, and besides your own individual faith narrative, um, I kept noticing parallels of this like intersecting individual social dynamic, um, especially in the ways that you covered the history of police uh, police formation in this country and also just kind of what you were speaking about there with um, the bishops only speaking out publicly on individual racism versus like acknowledging systemic racism um, is there. Um, and since both of these, so because these are such powerful institutions in our country right now, um, and because they aren't acknowledging the systemic realities of that, um, I, I know you kind of spoke to how you, the public acknowledgement of that is going to be and how powerful of a witness that would be. Um, but it, can you speak maybe a little bit more to even just on the sense of uh, police, police acknowledgement of it, what, what maybe some practical ways of that would look like for, um, for advancing Black liberation? 
So you're saying specifically like the response we would like I'd ideally love to see from law enforcement, you mean like what acknowledgement will look like from from those types of institutions? Um, yeah, like, yeah, like, uh, from from law enforcement and just also like, I guess maybe speak a little bit to um, the how on both of these powerful institutions, um, it, it stops it. They, they, they think it stops individual racism and the lack of and so the lack of systemic acknowledgement and how that kind of affects um affects laws affects policies affects the way that we have that if you can speak to that at all oh sure um i can i'll try i'm not the i, I as i mentioned in the book i'm just extremely new to abolitionist works and abolitionist um literature so there are definitely um people who can speak to that a little uh, more eloquently than i can but I think the reason that we see so many institutions just stop at that individual acts of racism or which a term we love to hear in our church, right? Everyone is prejudiced or everyone is capable of racism is because there's still this very incomplete understanding of what systemic racism actually is in the United States. And this was something that was even challenging for me. Like I had to unlearn a lot of the relationships that I had with law enforcement in this country or the con a lot of the conditioning that I had surrounding law enforcement right like in for most of my early 20s I would have never thought that you could abolish law enforcement because my understanding of this institution is oh you have been around since this country was created and you are this moral institution that keeps us safe because that's what we learn right we learn that in schools we see that all over Hollywood etc and so that very real, I think that there's so much conditioning that people have to unlearn and then people don't know how to talk about it systemically. I think institutions, one, as I mentioned earlier, have to get better about doing that, that public acknowledgement themselves because it really will help people to talk about racism more fully. If our bishops or other prominent people in the church had been talking about abolition, for the past 10, 15 years, think about what the conversation could have been now. Catholics would have been so much more comfortable with those terms. And I think that having, first of all, institutions need to figure out themselves how to have that conversation more, more broadly. And then I think it'll, again, trickling down, this will trickle down and help people start to have a deeper understanding. And once we start to have that understanding, then we get into the legislation, right? Then we start figuring out how things work at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, because I think that's something that has even been new for me to learn, just to realize how insidious white supremacy works within the U.S. government and within these institutions. So I think that that's the reason why there, we always stop at like, oh, you know, it's an individual act or discrimination happens at an individual level, but it's because people don't understand how to talk about it systemically, right? Like I didn't even have the language to talk about what systemic racism was until I started in engaging with black thinkers outside of the church, um, black women in particular who are, who are outside of the church, because it is not commonplace for white Catholicism or the white Catholic spaces that I was in to sort of talk about this. So I think that that's how we, start to change legislation and change policy, but we first have to start changing how people have those conversations. Because I think a lot of us don't even know what it means to talk about abolishing the law enforcement. We don't know how to, what it means to talk about restructuring education or all of these huge institutions. And that's what institutions themselves have to start doing and individual people have to start doing as well. I hope that kind of answered your question. That might've been a, a little rambly. <laughs> Um, when we're talking about the police, um, one narrative that you push back on throughout the book is that police departments and policing is um, fundamentally flawed and racist, that it's not just a couple of bad apples, like we hear people say when defending the current state of policing. And I really like the brief history that you gave about policing in the US and specifically how August Vollmer, who was the first police chief of the Berkeley, California Police Department um, in the early 20th, 20th century, how he has shaped and influenced the racism and inhumanity we see played out over and over again. So could you just give us a little brief history of that? And I'm hoping that people pick up the book and are able to read um, all this themselves. Sure, sure. Um, thank you um, for um, 
telling me that, uh, reminding me of that history myself. It's been so long since I've actually seen the text that it's always wonderful to kind of to learn that. So as you mentioned, Vollmer was this police chief in, in California and a lot of the practices that he implemented into policing um, were practices that were adopted in police stations all across the country. And he was described as someone who was reforming this institution, but his reforms were more militant against black and brown communities. He talked about, and I don't remember the quote exactly, but in one of the, in one of the texts that I, that I read about him, because he was also a teacher. And so he was teaching a lot of students who were entering the academy. And he talked about the differences between the races, how some races are more inclined to be dangerous and commit crimes. And so he was teaching people these ideas. He was putting these practices into, into play in his department. And then these were being picked up all across the country, right? Because he was seen as this brilliant man who was pushing these institutions into the future. And those practices have continued throughout history, only became more and more adapted in police departments across the country. And of course that became worse, the more technology, the better technology got, right? Like we saw a lot of the NYPD has some, has weapons that we wouldn't even think police departments should be having in the 21st century. And so that those practices are still felt now in the 21st century and all of those have gotten worse throughout the years and this is why again we're talking about the systemic oppression within these institutions this is why these things become so oppressive throughout the years right because these are practices that one were implemented and were really awful when they were implemented because if you describe them to people now you would never look at people would never look at this and, or I, I would like to think that people would look at these and realize how problematic they are but because they hailed this white man as the harbinger, harbinger, I always use that word incorrectly. I hope I said that, I hope I said that all right. But they viewed him as this man who was bringing in all these wonderful ideas, who was extremely brilliant. And we've seen this all across the industries, right? We saw it in the healthcare industry, we saw it in the insurance business. White men who have very dangerous ideas are, you, are centered, right? And then their practices are implemented and then that becomes the norm. That is why we have a healthcare system where black women are more likely to die during childbirth. This is why we have a prison industrial complex where black and Latinos are disproportionately incarcerated, right? And so that is the history of policing in this country. And for me, that was extremely shocking to learn, not shocking because I've never had an experience with law enforcement, but shocking because it makes you re it really makes you realize how ingrained oppression is into every institution in this country. And it is history that is in extremely, extremely important for our church to learn, especially because there is this impetus sort of in like Catholic spaces to associate what it means to be faithful with law enforcement. And that's why I wanted to make sure to include that history because we should be working more toward a, a Catholic church that is more comfortable saying, hey, we shouldn't rely on law enforcement to handle situations where communities might be dealing with trauma, right? Law enforcement shouldn't be called into these marginalized spaces. And so that history was really important for me to include, to include in the text. I think that that history is really important because um, it shows us how racism is learned and passed down from generation to generation. It's not a, the way that people are just built. Um, you also argue that the American church doesn't acknowledge or grapple with its role in slavery and racism. And if we are to be a universal church, then our church leaders must commit to a process of true and transformative accountability. What do you envision the church doing to accomplish this goal? I think what I envision the church doing is getting involved in the reparations movement. The church has, as you mentioned, Alessandra, they've been complicit in this very painful racist history that created the United States that we know today. We know from the research Shannon D. Williams that they had a very explicit role even before the 1619, the date that is used, is defined as the start of the chattel slavery industry in the United States. Her research shows us that the church was very explicitly involved in this process. And we know that segregation, that religious orders were segregated and kept black and brown people from joining. We know that to this day, the US church, as we see with the bishops, still has a very sort of white supremacist understanding of what it means to, to be in church. And I think that 
when you are a church that has been silent for so long and that has been unwilling to grapple with all of those things that I just laid out, which aren't even 50% of the things we know, the harms we know that our church has called, the only way to show these affected communities that you actually care is by helping them deal with the day-to-day -day realities, the day-to-day -day violence that they face because of this systemic oppression that they have participated in. And I think the only way to do that is financially. Um, again, because we know that black and brown communities all across the United States are one of the most under, are some of the most underfunded communities all across the country. And the church loves to say, well, you know, we have a lot of Catholic schools, we have a lot of programs that support a lot of marginalized communities, and that's all really wonderful, but there's still more that can be done. And I think that the church is an institution with a whole lot of money, and it needs to figure out how to get involved in that reparations talk, because I think that that is the number one way. Earlier you asked, what could our church do that would really show that they want to get involved in this movement? And that is one of the very immediate ways that they can do it, figure out how they can support the communities that they have harmed. Yeah, I think um, I, I love how you, how you, uh, I don't know if package is the right word, but just how you how you express that. Um, that was, I very much relate to that, where you're just, like just seeing, I, I think that that's the part that is sometimes missing from discussions is the nitty gritty practical things that are that are um, both our church and society can do in order to help this like the you know re uh, the redistribution of things you know and we'll talk about that a little bit later um, but just in turn like financial is very much what I feel like that's a, a theme that I've seen over and over and over in any articles you know podcast whatever that I've listened to um, is just how you like put your money where your mouth is you know um, and just how how vital that is and um, and just how like both knowledge and and uh, concrete action are going to be key in being able to um, and, and to being able for the church to be able to show that they are actually involved in this and like that they're actually putting a risk out there and they're actually putting their their um, money where their mouth is, <laughs> for lack of a better <laughs> term. Um, yeah, and so uh, one of the things I had also, um, it's kind, kind of along the same lines, but um, one thing that also really struck me about your work, um, and this I think fits in very well with like the with a lot of what Pope Francis has been saying, and um, I so I went to a Jesuit university as well, so I like very much, very much the whole like men and women for others and all that. Um, and uh, I noticed the theme of encounter as um, something that was very much a paradigm in your work. Um, and I think that that is a very uh, powerful, powerful paradigm to look at the um, black liberation and just reparations and everything through. Um, so I was, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about like some of the best ways you think that just like encounter can be kind of um, a paradigm or framework for moving forward, um, both as people of faith and members of society. Um, so I guess kind of keeping with that individual and collective uh, and systemic thing we were talking about as well. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I think. Well, before I get into sort of some of the ways that people can encounter one another, the reason I'm, that was such a huge theme in the book is because I would not be the writer that I am today or even the Catholic that I am today if I wasn't encountering, if I hadn't encountered the work of people who really made me step outside of my own privilege and who really step, helped made me step outside of my own understanding of what it means to be a community. And so the number one thing that I always suggest is one, follow every single black woman that you've ever heard me mention, follow their work and support them if you can as well. Because a lot of them are sharing this, are, a lot of them are public theologians, public intellectuals who are just doing this work on social media, sharing all of their knowledge. So always, always engage with their work and always pay them if you can and support them in that way. And the reason that I always start from there is because I come from an immigrant community. I was born in the Dominican Republic and I, my family arrived here in the early 90s. And the way that we talked about blackness within my own community was very much the way, not, 
not necessarily the, exactly the same, but the way that white America struggles to talk about racism, that is very much a problem in the Latin American, Latin American community. And so the Dominican Republic is an extremely black country in the Caribbean, but the way that Dominican Americans talk about it, you would think that we only had Spanish ancestors. And so I would not have been able to start talking about number one, my own privilege as someone who lives in a lighter skinned body, I would not have been able to begin talking about my own privilege and begin talking about challenging myself if I didn't encounter the work of thinkers outside of our church. And I'm only saying thinkers outside of our church because these happen to be the people who I was engaging with, but reading these women and really sitting in that discomfort because it is really uncomfortable when you are listening to someone's lived experience and they're saying, the things that have privileged you have been the actual cause of the violence in my life. And that happens for, that can be the case for anyone from a marginalized community, but sitting with someone else's lived experience and sitting with the trauma that systemic oppression in the United States has caused people who are darker skinned than me, people in my own family, that was really challenging. And that would not have happened if I hadn't encountered this work. And I tell people that is a part of the process. That is a part of what it means to get involved in this liberatory work, you have to encounter the things that are going to make you feel uncomfortable, encounter the people who have been doing this work and who know more than you and whose lived experiences are most affected by these, all of the various um, oppressions we've mentioned. And that was really crucial for me. And that was really crucial for the book because I wouldn't, again, I keep, I wanna keep, I keep sounding a little repetitive, but I wouldn't be the person that I am if I hadn't done this work. And that's why when I see a church and I'm, when I say church in this in this um, I, in this moment, I'm specifically talking about white Catholics. When I see such a discomfort and such an unwillingness to get involved, because you don't want to be un feel uncomfortable, we don't want to hurt, or we want to be really mindful of white fragility. That's not okay, right? I think that you have to sit in that and you have to encounter because encounter is the only way. You mentioned Pope Francis, Mary. Pope Francis talks a lot about going to the margins and meeting people where they are. And how are you going to do that if all you care about is your own discomfort and your own privilege? And so encounter really means learning and supporting the people who really actually know how to make this church and country better. Despite the oppression that our communities have faced, faced these are people who will continue to fight for a better world. And that's what encounter means for me. Encounter means stepping outside of yourself, stepping to the side and saying, you know what? I don't know what I'm talking about, but I wanna learn more. Let me, uh, let me allow other people to lead me, right? I think that there is this, people think that they have to be the ones to figure it out. They have to be the ones with all the answers. And that's not true. You can center other people and follow. I think our church should really be one that learns how to follow and learns how to truly be in community and solidarity because I think that's a part of encountering I think it's okay to say I'm going to let other people lead for a while and I'm going to let people lead who actually want to make this a more equitable and equitable church and country and so that's why encounter that's that's what I mean by the theme of encounter and what I hope people take take from that um think that was that was really really well uh expostulated upon I just I like I mean encount that's a theme that has spoken not only in my own faith journey but I just I've um so I'm a Catholic revert and um it was through an encounter with Jesus that I came back to my faith like it was that was what I have held on to in moments of crisis and moments of hardship and um I think as well that I mean, Jesus, I mean, I, I tell Jesus all the time, I'm so glad you're God. Like, I'm really glad that it's you. Um, but I think that the the figurehead of Jesus himself, and I think you had, you had talked about this in the book as well, is a theme um, for, for being able to relate. And I think that that is, that it's kind of like a good gateway for empathy for um, white Catholics. And I'm really glad you also brought up um, it being in the Latina community as well, because um, I, I didn't realize until I was uh, looking over your website that uh, you were that you also had like a, a Latinx background and every, I hope that's the right term um, like a, a Latin background and everything and um, I I think that you were so spot on about how 
because it kind of it also fits with some of the things you were talking about how racism is learned um like i have i have a friend who um who is studying over here from iraq and it was amazing because he had no experience with uh with like you know black uh with black people here in my i'm from st louis so um and then the way to hear the way he was talking about it he was like uh embracing that sense of danger like he picked that up and he'd only been here for a few months so it's like it's insidious it's everywhere like you were saying Mm -hmm. and um and i think that a key way for our both our church um and our society but especially within the context of faith that we're going to be able to um to help to help move forward the cause of black liberation um is through that sense of encounter like you were saying and i was wondering um because i I know you had used this as kind of a figurehead for your um or not a figurehead but like a again a paradigm for um relating and talking about it in the context of faith this idea of jesus um of the suffering christ and jesus on the cross um is is a way of paralleling that with the suffering that marginalized communities have gone through and just as a white catholic i think that that is such because it's like when you i don't know i've always just thought like when you see people you can't you can't make them an archetype they're they're, they have their own stories their own individuality and that's what is really going to move people and change hearts um and i guess i was just wondering if you could also speak to um how you think the figurehead of christ could cultivate more empathy or just that idea of suffering um and help people both in and out of um, different demographics to relate to that. Sure, sure. Um, And for that, I have to shout out M. Sean Copeland, who is just a brilliant thinker, theologian, um, just all around superstar in this church, who really, really was the first person to kind of help me to really think about the resurrection and to really think about this idea of, of the suffering Christ. I think for me, in my own sort of, Catholic um, faith journey, I have never really thought about the resurrection. Like I've obviously thought about the resurrection because it's integral to our faith, but I never thought about why suffering is so crucial to our faith or what it means for us to believe in a Christ who really suffered for us, right? And that was something that I didn't really start thinking about until I engaged with the work of M. Sean Copeland, who really says, Christ the image of this suffering Christ on the cross is really a reminder and a challenge that Christ is not just moving in all of the beautiful, wondrous ways that we know Christ is moving. Christ is also moving in people who you might look at them and say, oh my God, how could they, how could they survive? Like, how were they surviving so much tragedy and so much oppression? And that idea that God is moving in that. God is moving in those moments of complete desolation and those moments of complete tragedy. That was so extremely profound for me because I was writing this book at a time when New York was completely shut down. Every week we were hearing that a friend, a friend's parent had died or someone who, a friend of a friend had lost someone or someone we knew had passed away. And then relatives of ours had gotten sick. And there were moments where I was in a really, really dark place. And I thought, what's the point of all of this? What is the point of trying to survive in a nation that literally is telling us we do not care if black and brown communities die. We do not care if we have to reopen the economy again because we don't care that you guys are being devastated by this. It was extremely, extremely, I don't even know what the word is, but the in the effect that 2020 had on my faith was very, very profound. And I encountered M. Sean Copeland's work. I returned to her work in that moment and I thought, oh, okay, this is what this means, right? Like we are suffering right now and we are suffering and God is still moving, right? God is still moving in all of that tragedy. And it's also a reminder that this is not the end for us, right? We are not fighting, like this is not the ultimate end for us. And that again was also kind of devastating to know that like, you know what? I'm fighting for liberation, but it's a liberation that I'm probably not going to see, right? But I'm hoping that my children will at least see or my great grandkids will see, right? And just understanding that was devastating, but also I'm like, okay, this is what faith is, right? We know that even when we're suffering, that is where God moves, right? That is what going to the margins mean. It means not running away from that. It means trying what, however you can to 
make the world a better place, but knowing that that suffering, God is there as well. And that is what I think the image of Christ on the cross, the image of Christ suffering, especially we're, we're about to go into Lent, right? And Catholics, we love talking about the suffering um, during, during Lenten season, but that's what I think a lot of people can learn. I think that it is really easy to know that God, and this was, this was challenging for me to learn because I was often talking about my spirituality when I was at America, I was on Jesuitical and I was often saying like, okay, God was definitely moving in that moment, right? Because that's a really beautiful, wonderful thing that only God could possibly have, have, have done. But it wasn't really until last year that I understood, oh, no, 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 like God is moving in those moments. And that is what Christ calls us to do, right? He calls us to understand that I died a really tragic death for you guys. So this suffering is a part of is a part of what we're what we feel and what we're called to understand as as Catholics. But again, it's not the end, right? And I think that that's what that's what we are supposed to take from that. And again, I'm borrowing all of this from M. Sean Copeland and other brilliant theologians because I am not <laughs> this eloquent with theology or philosophy. But that's what I think that people can learn. I think that it is just a reminder that you continue to do this work. You continue to do this work that's really challenging and really really hard and really traumatic. Every day, people are talking about the trauma that that they are suffering in doing this work. But as Catholics, we know it's not the end. We know that there is hope at the end. And that's what I think, that's what I think that suffering and that Christ on the cross really, really represents for us. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, sorry, I just want to jump in and say that the, um, the verse that 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 you're talking about the injustice suffering that's been very transformative in my own personal life too um but it's that bible verse that um, my power is made perfect in weakness um i think that just that that like sums up literally all that theology and all that it's so like god i've seen that on both a personal level and then i think you know like you were saying on the systemic level as well that that is that paradigm that that um, that transformation, that's the word I always come back to with, with suffering, that that is what is, is right. gonna, gonna do that. So I just wanted to speak because I was like, that Bible verse is screaming to me right now. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I think it's really important also, um, that when we talk about, um, Jesus as the figurehead, that we reclaim the truth that Jesus was a Jewish person of color living under Roman occupation, that he wasn't this white guy with blonde hair and blue eyed like we often see. And just acknowledging that truth can also be an entryway for people of color to um, encounter Jesus in a different way. Um, but the question I had is that um, when we, when you speak about having to reimagine a theology that isn't centered on whiteness, but in um, Christian servitude of women like the founders of BLM, or when you talk about like centering around people of color, um, the question I have is that I think Catholics can think it's dangerous to center our faith on anyone other than Jesus. So can you explain what you mean a little more when you're talking about um, set, like reimagining our theology? to center around um, people of color? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Alessandra. That's a really wonderful question. And I think you kind of answered it in the preface before your question, where it can be extremely affirming for Christians of color to imagine Christ as who he really was, right? This brown man from the Middle East, this Jewish man who was killed by the state. And that is such a profound way and extremely affirming for my own faith life alone, just sort of anecdotally, that has been profound to be able to sort of understand, oh, hey, right, white Jesus is not the Jesus who I'm supposed to be following. Jesus is actually this man who looks more like our community than we realize. And so when I say that I, I like to, I think it's important to reimagine a theology centered in people who look like us, men and women who look like us. I think what, I'm, what I mean to say is not necessarily um, that we are negating Jesus, but who in my day-to-day -day life shows me what Jesus means, what Jesus calls us to live out in the gospel. And that, that is what, that has been so important for my own theology, because sometimes, sometimes it can be very overwhelming, especially for someone like me, I'm not super theological. So it can be very difficult for me to connect to this idea that we have of God, or this idea that we have of Christ. It can feel as if it's completely unrelatable or it can feel so, so too profound for me to comprehend. So for me, 
it's easier to say, okay, well, if this is what Jesus calls us, Jesus calls us to radically love and encounter other people and radically fight to dismantle systems of oppression and to fight for a better world, who is showing me how to do that? Because I, every day I'm like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means to try to survive in this very capitalist oppressive country. I don't know what it means to try to survive, but also have a really good faith life and to still believe in the Christ crucified that we mentioned. And so when I talk about recentering that theology, I like to think of who are the women and men who are showing me what it is to actually do that? Who are the men and women who are showing me what it means to be in service of other to other people? What it means to actually go to the margins, right? Because go to the margins is something that sounds really, really beautiful, but what does that actually mean? And so seeing women like Tarana Burke, the founder of the V2 movement, or Sister Norma Pimentel, who's at the border doing immigration work, they are obviously not Christ, right? Because Christ is Christ and no one can be Christ but they are showing me what we're supposed to do as Christ, as people who believe in Christ, as people who believe in the hope and power of our faith. These are, who are the people that are showing me what it means to live, to live out that Christ call. And so that's what I mean when I talk about centering those lived experiences, because I think it helps, it has helped me to be more theological and to be more committed to my faith. And so I think that it can help us encounter Jesus more when we imagine everyday people who are doing that work and so that's that was what my that's what I hope my people can take from from that okay that makes a lot of sense and I think that's really important um uh, you talk about um when you talk about the disparities in the United States and the advantages that white Americans have over people of color and especially black and indigenous people, you call on white Catholics to rebuke their power and privilege. And you quote Father Brian Massengill who said, quote, anything they, and they meaning the USCCB, say about race always has the comfort of white Catholics in mind. The white comfort sets the terms of Catholic engagement with the issues of race, unquote. And like you had said before, um, the future we're fighting for is one we most likely will never see. So what do you think are concrete steps that white Catholics should take that can be accomplished in our lifetime? Because I don't imagine the majority of white Catholics wanting to rebuke their white power or white privilege in the country. But what do you think are concrete steps that white Catholics can take? Sure, so I think a lot of the immediate concrete steps that they can take are a lot of what we mentioned earlier, supporting organizers who are on the ground doing this work, trying to encounter these, these thinkers and learn from them. But I also think more, 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 um, more, even more concretely than that, I think especially people who are in, for example, education, right? We know that Catholic institutions, Catholic colleges are still very, very white. Um, Catholic media, still very, very white. And I think spaces like that even though it's very hard to tell someone and say, hey, you have to rebuke your power and create spaces, but that's what they have to do, right? If we want to create a Catholic, for example, a, a Catholic media landscape that is less centered and white, then that requires white people involved in these spaces to say, you know what? I need to figure out how to center black, brown, indigenous, other people of color. Like how, how am I going to create that space? Is it going to be, I'm going to, commit to having a certain number of articles or writers? And it doesn't mean committing to hiring a certain number of editors in the next day or a certain number of professors if it's an academic institution. I think that those are very concrete solutions that should absolutely be taken in our lifetime. And I, I, I say this often when I talk publicly, these are the spaces that along with everything that I say that I hope the bishops do, these Catholic institutions, this Catholic media, uh, Catholic academia, these are institutions with a whole lot of power and a lot of resources and those institutions should make those type of public commitments. I think that they should commit to hiring more people of color, hiring more professors of color, allowing more writers to have the resources. And I think those are commitments that people should be taking because those are commitments that can, we can see in our lifetime. And so I think that those are, those are some of the changes that I would like to see because I think one of the things that I love, you guys created the Black Catholic Messenger because you know that we have been kept out of a lot of spaces. And it's wonderful to see institutions and organizations that are 
coming up um, and creating these spaces. I'm thinking of you guys, and I'm also thinking of the Catholic Speakers of Color that was created by Leticia Adams. Those are all really, really wonderful steps. And I love seeing that, but also I don't want, want white media to say, oh, okay, well, we don't have to create spaces for you guys because you guys are doing your own thing, right? I think that they should also commit publicly to actually having goals in their institutions. And I think those, again, are things that we can actually see um, in our lifetime. Um, and I know in the book, you talk about your faith and specifically being raised by a devout mother who um, doesn't attend mass and a Seventh-day Adventist father. And um, you also talk that, about not being baptized, um, but the tenets of the Catholic faith have informed everything that you do professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit later in the book, you mentioned that um, you and your husband started going to different denominations outside of the Catholic church. Um, and then we're going to a Baptist church in September, 2019. So I was just kind of wondering um, how you see your relationship to Catholicism um, and your faith practice in the church as someone who doesn't receive the sacraments. And um, I'm not sure if you're no longer attending mass, but just kind of where you see yourself in the church now. I see myself as very much a part of the church. I see myself as um, a cradle Catholic. I like to say someone once um, in my old, when I used to work in America described me as a cradle Catholic without the sacraments. And that's how I, I've kind of stolen that, that um, description. But I see myself as very much a part of this church and I want to get baptized. I want to enter this church and be in full, full communion with the rest of my Catholics. But it's also very difficult when you see all of the things happening in our church. It's very difficult when you see all of the public statements, derogatory statements that we see from faith leaders and not just our bishops, right? We're talking about other priests, we're talking about other white Catholics who have just said things um, that are really, really traumatic to sort of see. And so I, I still consider myself a part of this church and I want to be a part of this church, but I'm at a point right now where my own spiritual life is in such a dark place because of everything that is just happening in, in this country. And so it's hard for me. I'm at a place where there is this tension and I'm still going to mass. I'm still going to other services outside of, of Catholic spaces. And I'm still extremely grateful for those spaces, but I'm also at a place where I'm, I'm really struggling spiritually. And I think that a lot of people are struggling. And for me, that means that, yes, I want to enter this church, but it's a matter of when, right? I want, I want to, and this, this again changes depending on the week that you talk to me about it. Sometimes I'm like, I'm going to get baptized as soon as the world opens up. And then other times I'm like, oh, really, do I like want to be a part of this institution that continues to, to sort of set us back? Um, but that's, that's, that's where I am. That's my relationship with the church right now. It's, it, it's constantly oscillating. I think that that is a really important um, point because I know a lot of Black Catholics, especially um, during 2020, were struggling with um, their relationship to the church. And I know personally, it was because of the sacraments, because of the Eucharist, because of adoration, um, even when churches were closed down, that I still felt my faith and how important it was. Um, but there was a topic I wanted to address because one of the biggest um, criticisms of BLM was that in their um, mission statement, they had said they wanted to disrupt the um, Western notion of the nuclear family. And I believe that that was later removed from the website and from the mission. But um, I noticed this wasn't discussed in the book, but I did want you to just kind of talk about that a little bit because it was such a big sticking point for Catholics. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that that was such a huge sticking point for a lot of Catholics, at least in, in, in my own, that I've encountered in my own reporting and my own sort of professional career. That was such a difficult thing for a lot of Catholics to grapple with because I think a lot of them saw it as, oh, we don't believe in families. We don't believe in marriage. We don't believe in having children. But to me, that just means this very white Western understanding of what it means to be family. And that doesn't just mean the traditional family units that we're talking about, man and wife. I think it means more broadly, just culturally, how we raise families in this country. The United States is a very individualistic society. And we see that in 
our we see that our like in my own academics like that is the culture that I was ingrained that was that I internalized right there's this very individualistic idea of what it means to be independent in this country what it means to be successful and that is something that is passed down in a, in, in many many Amer many first world western countries and I think that I saw that more as we think that there should be a family unit that doesn't just think that we have to talk about what it means to be a family by the, through this white lens. And I think that that is just, a lot of people struggle with that because again, in our church, people are very, and again, because this is an institution that has a very traditional understanding, church teaching tells us that marriage is between a man and woman. We, we know the teachings of our, our, of our church. And I think when you encounter a movement that tells you, no, 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 families can also be women married to women and raising children. That is very, very difficult for a lot of Catholics to hear. Um, and I think that that's why so many people struggle with it. I think that when you encounter a, a movement that has a more inclusive understanding of what it means to be family than our church, that creates this, the sort of uh, pushback that we got, from, that I encountered from a lot of Catholics. Yeah, um, and I'm I'm glad that um, that that particular tenet of um, of BLM's mission statement was brought up. I remember reading an article because that was something that I immediately was like like okay like what does this actually you know what does this mean can can they elaborate and I remember coming across an article that talked um, it it wasn't even so much just like man woman type of family, but it was talking about how it, what you had talked about with the um, individualistic notion of um, that like Western society has, especially Americans. Um, and it talked about how like in the app, like I think it was in the African influence that um, that it's like it's more of like a it takes a village, you know, to to raise people so that the nuclear family could be um, like the idea of family and what it is could be expanded to include like uh, extended family or like, for example, um, I remember reading about in black communities where uh, like, you know, they they would go to their grandmother's house or their cousins are considered part of like family. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the idea of like what the, the sort of nuclear family is. So I thought that was, that to me was, answered it and was a very powerful way and I think that it's something that we see again in the universal church it's not just like just because it's not uh publicized in like mm -hmm. the white American mm -hmm. version of, of Catholicism um that it's it doesn't mean it's not valid to have extended family and like that's how it was for historically like there's I don't know I could talk about that all day but <laughs> yeah um was that something that you encountered as well when you uh were talking with when you were like learning about Black Lives Matter especially from the founders was that that idea of like it, it takes a village was that something that that you encountered a lot Sorry, you kind of broke out on my end a little bit. Could you repeat the last part? Sorry about that. Sure. Oh God, no, you're fine. My connection um, is, has been a little wonky this week. It's okay. Bit, but I think I think it, it's it's my connection there. That's okay. Um, I was just saying, like, uh, when we were talking about this nuclear family dynamic, that was a sticking point. Um, just how. Or did you, when you were like, especially conversing with the um, BLM founders and everything, was, did they talk about the idea of the nuclear family being kind of like, it takes a village type of thing? Like, oh, oh no, she was connected. <laughs> so it looks like Olga's connection might have, um, yeah. that we might have dropped that for a second. Yeah. So um, Mary, if you want, while we're waiting for Olga to come back, if you want to, um, we could talk a little bit more. I mean, I think that um, I learned a lot about Black Lives Matter and as someone who's on the very older side of being a millennial, um, <laughs> I learned about some um, terms more in depth um, when you're talking about things like abolition and we're, when you're talking about like um, transformative justice, I feel like the book gave me a better context for these buzzwords that you hear, but maybe you don't necessarily understand. Did you have that experience? Very much so. Very, very much so. That was one of the things that I really appreciated about her book was that it gave not only the historical, but 
definition type of context as well like it just it because it's so easy to just like throw out those archetypes and those words um and and just like go with our immediate associations of it um and i i've loved how her book did that like some like i learned i didn't know about the um the guy volmer august volmer or whatever like i learned about him for the first time there's more history i had encountered over the course of 2020 but i think just having that contextualized history you can't deny it when it's there and i think that that gives that gives a sense of grounding and like depth to what so many people see as objections to it so i i very much had that experience and then can you also check the waiting room in case um, yeah she it yeah she's not she's not okay. back yet i'm gonna go ahead and um I'm just gonna see if she emailed me or anything. Hold on. I'm still recording right now just to keep it. Okay. And um, while we're waiting, I'll also talk a little bit. Um, I know that there was a section in the book where Olga talked about 9-11 and for her, she was a young girl who was living in New York at that time um, when the terrorist attack happened. And it was interesting um, hearing it from her point of view because I think she said that she saw George Bush, who was the president, as almost like um, a savior for the country and that she was going to be, he was going to be protecting the country from these terrorists who were trying to attack um, our democracy. And I thought that was really interesting because at the time I was a sophomore in college and um, it was, in the years after that, when we ended up going to war with Iraq and Afghanistan, that I ended up um, becoming active with like the anti-war protest. And then when Hurricane Katrina happened and just seeing the government response to the um, mainly black Americans who were devastated, it really um, changed me in a way that I think for Olga and me, younger Catholics and younger people of color happened with like the Black Lives Matter movement with Trayvon Martin getting mm -hmm. killed um, and Michael Brown getting killed. So I think that it's interesting how there's different turning points in our lives where we're kind of, um, our eyes are open to injustices in our society. I I think that is a, re that's a really interesting um I, I like how you phrase that, like how the par uh, like transformative moments, because very like 9-11 was was one of those for me in terms of just seeing like I I very much relate to Olga because I'm I think I'm pretty close in age to her just in terms of like um, where or what would have impressed upon me as a transformative moment. And it's interesting because I have found myself going back and watching like coverage of 9-11 that happened during, I mean, when it happened or whatever. I think that you're very, very right about like Black Lives Matter being that that sort of like moment of crisis or moment of awareness for so many people that are in the younger millennial, I guess, generation um, or younger side of the millennial <laughs> generation. Um, it's, 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 I think that almost is even even kind of a paradigm that fits in with that sense of like transformative suffering that we were talking about earlier too. It's like those moments of crisis that transform our understanding, those moments of conversion and encounter. Um, I think that, that there could be a lot, a lot of reflection or points for contemplation on that. Um, just when thinking about those transformative like moments in our, in our actual everyday lives concretely um, when you think about it from the lens of faith, too, I think that that's definitely something to, I don't know, just a point of reflection. I could talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> um, also, I what I was going to mention to Olga was that I appreciated how she fleshed out the stories and faith of African-American women like Tarana Burke, who she mentioned, who started the Me Too movement. And a lot of times people think that Alyssa Milano was the founder of the YouTube Me Too movement, but that's actually not the truth. It was actually an African-American woman whose Christian faith had propelled her to do this work. Um, and then she also mentioned Lucy McBath, 
whose son, Jordan David, was murdered by a white man who complained that the music in the car that Jordan was in with his friends was too loud and ended up um, shooting and killing him. And McBath is now a House representative for Georgia's sixth dis district. And I do hope that people read these stories to understand how much faith in God has influenced people's lives and called them to advocate advocate for justice and change, whether it's around racial justice, whether it's around se sexual assault, um, gun violence. I think that too often the narrative is that the people who are in these movements are leftist and that they're anti-Christian and that they're all Marxist. And that's just simply not true. So I'm hoping that people who um, read the book will be able to see more in depth some of these um, key players who are Christian, whose um, Christian faith does motivate them and the activism that they do. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm really glad that, because when, just when we were looking over our questions and stuff, I, I'm really glad you brought that up because I, it, so it's, it's very interesting coming at this discussion from a white Catholic perspective, um, not in a way that where I'm like trying to center my own experience, but just where I've noticed how white experiences are kind of default centered in that, like what you talked about with like Alyssa Milano um, be commonly thought of as the founder of that. I think that it's so, that's just, it, it speaks to what Olga was talking about, like with the insidiousness of just how white supremacy is literally, it's just so ingrained into our culture. I, I think I, um, the, someone had used an analogy one time of like where it's like a jar of rocks and then like water going down it's like it it just it goes into every little crevice every little crack you don't even recognize it sometimes or just it's it's down into the min most minute ways um and i think what's why it's so important to like read the book for for those stories is not only to get you know, the, the visibility of those stories out and to show like, that's, I mean, personally, that's what I've come to see as my is one of the biggest things that I can do in the way of using privilege that I didn't ask for, but just happened to be born with because of the color of my skin, that the best way that I can do that is by amplifying it's helping to amplify those voices of color and telling those stories of, of black or BIPOC really, men and women who have done this work for centuries and just getting that awareness out there um, and just, you know, continuing to be loud about it and not be afraid to talk about it, especially with, sorry, I feel like I'm going on a little bit of a tangent, but I just, it's it's a mission. It, it's it's a very much rooted in a sense of mission for me personally um, that, that shows kind of like what you were saying about how there's so many so many common misconceptions that like BLM is anti-Christian or whatever but it's it's actually the exact opposite that they're that their Christianity their faith um the the figures that Olga talks about in her book are they were motivated by that Christianity I think that that is it, I don't know it's, it's a very interesting paradox that like that perception, I think it speaks to basically, well, I think it just really speaks to how like black history and, you know, how people of color have been treated where somehow what is like, that's the a nature of white supremacy is where it'll take like something good that, you know, a person of color contributes and find some way to attribute violence to it or some way to attribute, um, I don't know, just like the thuggishness, you know, the typical buzzwords that you hear. I don't know. I feel like I'm rambling now, but that's, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that we're going to end um, our show for today. Um, yeah. I want to thank you again, Mary, for um, helping us with the Olga um, interview. And I want to thank um, Olga for taking time to speak with us in our BCM audience. And if you listeners would like to reach out to us as a contributor, like I said in the beginning, we have a pinned tweet on our Twitter at BLKCATH stories. 
and there's a Google form where you can reach us. Um, you can also follow me online on Twitter. I'm at Alessandra H17 and Instagram at Alessandra.Harris17. And my YouTube channel um, is Alessandra Harris Author. And Mary, if you could let people know where they can also um, follow you. Sure. Um, so I'm probably the best places on Twitter. Um, I'm at Mary, so M-A-R-Y underscore um, my last name, Bast, B-A-S-T. Um, I'm on Instagram as as well, but I don't really ever use it very much. Twitter is probably the best place to, to reach me in that sense. Um, and then my website, which will hopefully be getting updated very soon, is MaryBastWriter.com. So that's where you can reach me. <laughs> Great. And my website's alessandraharris.net. Yeah. So thank you. And we hope that you guys all enjoyed this show. And See thank, you next time. All right. And thank you, Olga, for coming on. <laughs>